Quote, Considered by some to be the very embodiment of evil, Rakshasas dominate all they encounter as masterful manipulators, powerful sorcerers, and terrible foes. Greedy, treacherous, immortal beings, Rakshasas delight in plotting the downfall of others while raising their own status. In addition to their own abilities, Rakshasas are charismatic individuals who draw large numbers of minions into their service, surrounding themselves with cadres of deadly and varied servitors. Clever and deceitful by nature, Rakshasas are the bane of righteous creatures, as they prefer hiding in the shadows and using layers of lies, corruption, and double crosses to keep themselves safe. It is very curious how this is one of those monsters that I feel like everybody knows. Most players seem to recognize the name Rakshasa and generally it seems like they know what to expect when you present them with one. This is one of those things I would probably attribute to Critical Role, of course the famous D&D show where this monster makes an appearance. So most of the introductory stuff you will already know, including how they are supposed to look like. They are humanoid tiger hybrids with very powerful sorcerer's abilities. They are fiends with a devilish background who happen to be immune to most spells, which is probably what they're the most famous for. Rakshasas cannot be hit by any spell lower than 7th level, but to make matters even worse, they also happen to be immune to non-magical attacks. This translates into a foe that is literally invincible for most starting adventurers. This is also coupled with the fact that when a Rakshasa dies, it, that is not truly the end of it. Instead, it is merely a setback, and a long, painful setback as the body of the monster materializes in the Nine Hells before it can find its way back to the material world. I should also mention that a particularly defining feature of the Rakshasa outside of the obvious tiger body is the fact that its hands are upside down. That being, the palm of its hand is where the back of your hand would be, as you can see here in the picture. Now when it comes to behavior, Rakshasas use subtlety and misdirection to dominate people. They use their considerable intellect, charisma, and magics to sway the weak of mind into working for them. Using these features, they almost always end up becoming merchant kings or nobles and live a life of decadency and power. And of course, they would. Living life on the material plane and abuse it is all that they ever wanted, for Rakshasas used to be powerful devils in the Nine Hells who performed secret and dark rituals to free their essence from their fiendish bodies in order to escape the older planes. And now that they are free from the Hells, they roam the real world and torment it for their absolute gain. I have just described to you the entry of the Rakshasa in the Monster Manual. Basically, everything that we just talked about was directly taken from here. But believe you me, there is so much more about these monsters that the Monster Manual does not tell you, but hey, that is why we are here. Let's go ahead and talk about what the Monster Manual does not tell you about Rakshasas. What I think is the most expected, but still the most considerable surprise about these creatures is that there really isn't as much uniformity between the way that they look as much as you would think. Their hands being upside down is but one example. The second edition of Dungeons and Dragons claims that it is a very common occurrence between Rakshasas that they have these upside down hands, but that it is by no means something that all of them suffer. The biggest thing, however, would be the hybridness of their bodies. It turns out that the tiger type of Rakshasa is but simply one style. In fact, there are actually many types of Rakshasas. There are Rakshasas with carnivorous ape heads, which are actually very common, but there have even been sights of those that possess mantis heads out there. It is literally described to us that the tiger head Rakshasas are only slightly more common than the rest, and not even by a lot. See, Rakshasas venerate a mysterious god called Ravana, which is known to have over 10 heads, which forms part of the culture of these particular monsters, in that they can each have different types and styles of heads. In fact, some Rakshasas, get this, can even have more than one head. It is described to us that some of the more powerful Rakshasas, like the ones that lead entire clans off them, have two or even three heads. 
Now, of course, most times that a Rakshasa deals with humanoids, it is doing so under either illusion magic or through one of their many transformations. Rare will it be the time when you will actually get to see one's true body. Now, let's talk about the eyes. Quote, Rakshasa's eyes vary vastly, from the gold and black slits of tigers to the multifaceted protruding orbs of insects, depending on the individual animalistic visage. Regardless of the shape, the eyes burn with a slight infernal light, filled with a deep cunning and intellect that most mortals will find extremely disturbing." End quote. Now, Rakshasas do have communities and clans where they live together, though we're not really described much of what a day-to-day -day life of the Rakshasa might look under those premises. What we are actually told is that their society is bound by very rigid castes, whereas each Rakshasa is born into a particular role in life and cannot advance. For example, we are very explicitly told that females who are called Rakshasi are fit only to be consorts and are honored only by their faithfulness and the fighting ability of their children. It is a particularly rigid patriarchy where only the male Rakshasas are allowed to rule in spite of the fact that females greatly and vastly outnumber males, sometimes up to a ratio of 3 to 1. We also know that those of honored birth are called Rooks, which roughly translates to knights. These are believed to be the guardians of the Rakshasa community, the great warriors. On top of them are what we call the Rajas, or lords, who are the patriarchs and leaders of the local clan. And then on top of those, we finally have the Maharajas, or the dukes, which are the leaders of several clans put together, or of a single large powerful clan. As far as we are aware, there has never been the need to name a King Rakshasa, as there has probably never been one. For the most part, these monsters are very solitary and they seldom gather in large groups like these. When they do, however, what you do end up seeing are island nations of a couple of hundred Rakshasa. Now, the way Rakshasas gain notoriety in their culture is very interesting because, like I said before, generally you are born into a caste system and you're basically just stuck there forever. You can't really get wealthy and buy yourself a good house in a better part of town, so to speak. You can't just become famous by doing something cool and then marry well. If you are from a lesser caste, then you can only live where the lesser caste lives. And you can only work where the lesser caste works. That's just the way the system is designed. The only way for a Rakshasa to gain honor within this style of society is essentially through the manipulation of humanoids. That being, if a Rakshasa through politics and some as the leader of a major human city, then other Rakshasas will respect him regardless of caste. See, this should explain this better. Quote, Rakshasa society could be described as a malevolent meritocracy where only the fittest survive. Rakshasas constantly rank each other based on the power that they accumulate, their cunning and subtlety, and their willingness to show a complete lack of morals. Female Rakshasas raise their young alone, punctuating their children's lives with dotting praise, constant tests, harsh discipline, and ruthless training. As a young Rakshasa matures, it learns the meaning of both loss and power. That which is gained might be easily be taken away, often by those who gave it in the first place. Once the Rakshasa reaches maturity, it's already well on its way to carving out an empire of crime and evil. Newly independent Rakshasas commonly head out for unknown territories, far from their parents or any other Rakshasa's reach. Using a variety of disguises, the Rakshasa spends years investigating a new area. A Rakshasa instinctively seeks out a safe house from which to operate, decorating its interior in ostentatious displays of its wealth. It then begins creating a network of spies, informants, and easily bribed officials from which to establish its domain, as well as creating a small cadre of loyal, easily influenced lackeys. The Rakshasa then creates or takes over local thieves' skills, mercenary units, and other undesirables, often doing so under one disguise or another. It rarely reveals its true nature to anyone but utterly dedicated lieutenants whose loyalty the Rakshasa constantly monitors both via spies and its own ability to read thoughts." End quote. 
As a Rakshasa builds its empire, it is inevitable really that it will encounter one such as itself. When this happens is when you see something more akin to a mafia movie, where a shadowy war of intrigue and misinformation starts, a battle of criminal politics where it will only end with either the complete domination of one of them or the other one's death, with the winner taking over the network of the other. This is how truly a Rakshasa grows in honor in a Rakshasa society. As it grows in power and dominates more of its kin, eventually it'll start gaining prestigious titles. Titles like Rook, like Raja, or even the mighty Maharaja. Rakshasa's obsession with humanoids is interesting because it is all over the place. They like to dominate them, they like to enslave them, to rule over them, but more than all, they just like being around them. A Rakshasa living with other Rakshasas is one thing, but you would never see one living by itself, somewhere out there secluded. It just needs us. It loves the clothes that we make, our wines, our pillows, our music, but most of all, our flesh. Don't ever delude yourself into thinking that it is all about our culture or all about domination. To them, the biggest drive is and will always be our flesh. Rakshasas are carnivores, and their favorite food is humanoid flesh, something that they go through all kinds of troubles and ruses simply to obtain. What makes it harder for them, and the reason that they need all kinds of illusions and tricks to obtain it, is because of the fact that they like it not just fresh, but while the meal is still alive. They season living people with fresh and rare spices, exotic side dishes, and other expensive delicacies as they eat them. If the meal is not squirming and screaming, then it is just not the same. This is why they require complex tricks, as they would rather do the killing themselves in the comfort of their dining table. And of course, even better if they don't stain their favorite expensive clothes with someone else's blood while in the process. One of the most successful tricks in the Rakshasa's arsenal is their ability to take on the form of a person that you trust. See, Rakshasas famously have what we call ESP, Extrasensory Perception, or a Sixth Sense. Basically, they have the ability to perceive things not just through touch or smell or sight or taste or sound, but through a sixth sense. Specifically, Rakshasas have the natural ability to read minds and sense your emotions. Now, this is still magical. I know that the way that I described it sounds like psionics, but that's just the way it is described. Just do keep in mind that it is still 100% magical. This is simply basically just a born natural thing that the Rakshasas can do and do 24-7. It is always active for this creature. So when you meet a Rakshasa, the creature can actually sense in your mind who is a person that you trust or a type of person that you trust and then he abuses it. For example, if you're the type of person who trusts city guards explicitly, then the Rakshasa might transform into one just to lower your defenses and then eat you. If given enough time to read through your mind, it might transform into a loved one in order to fool you and so on and so forth. It actually uses this very powerful ability in order to sense who is loyal to him and who isn't, and it uses this to form tight inner circles that will not betray it. Rakshasas go out of their way to make sure that their empires are run tight, that there are no squeaky wheels and that nobody will betray him. But isn't that quite interesting? You look at the Rakshasa and you see what it is capable of, and yet, sometimes it feels like it just cowers in fear, behind walls and minions. It fears that it will be betrayed. It does everything with subtlety. Why? It cannot be hurt by any spell lower than 7th level, which basically eliminates the vast majority of spellcasters in the world. It has the ability to read minds, which means that he figuratively cannot be stabbed in the back. And he also happens to be immune to mundane non-magical weapons, which means that he literally cannot be stabbed in the back. So what's up? What's the deal with all of this protection? You would think that this guy could turn into the invincible overlord and just rule his own kingdom with an iron fist. So why doesn't he? 
Well, the answer is kind of a secret. A secret that not many actually know, and the clues to this secret actually lie in the monster manual itself. In the stat block of the Rakshasa, you have this very interesting weakness. It says right here that the Rakshasas are vulnerable to piercing magical weapons wielded by good creatures. Now, this is actually new. It was added to the 5th edition entry for the Rakshasa. The creature actually never really had this weakness in any of the previous editions, but it did have something relatively similar. See, this weakness is meant to mask the actual thing. In reality, according to 5th, 2nd, and 3rd edition, and according to the ecology of the Rakshasa from the Dungeon Magazine, and according to the creator of Dungeons and Dragons, Rakshasas suffer from a crippling weakness, very similar to that of vampires. You know how vampires are one of the most powerful creatures in the world, able to regenerate more than almost any other monster, being virtually unkillable. But they have this insane weakness to a simple wooden stake that can be used to completely incapacitate them. Well, Rakshasas have something very similar. Rakshasas have a weakness to crossbow bolts infused with a holy blessing. If a blessed crossbow bolt were to touch the flesh of a Rakshasa, the monster will be slain instantaneously. Let's go ahead and read it. This is the entry for the Rakshasa from 1st edition. Quote, they are not affected by spells under the 8th level. Rakshasas cannot be harmed by non-magical weapons. Magical weapons below plus 3 do one half damage. But crossbow bolts, blessed by a cleric, kill them." End quote. This is the entry for the Rakshasas in 2nd edition, and here it is. Quote, a hit by any blessed crossbow bolt kills a Rakshasa instantly. End quote. This, ladies and gentlemen, is why a Rakshasa never goes Overlord. Even if the armies fighting him don't actually know about this secret, which is likely, he's still bound to be hit by a single blast crossbow bolt from a cleric. I mean, the chances are actually pretty high when you're facing an army. Now, this is the part where you all debate in the comment section about why a crossbow bolt? Does an arrow work just as well? What about a blessed bullet from a gun? The reality is that I actually don't want to answer that because I legitimately think that it is going to ruin the mystery because I, well, it kind of ruined it for me. What I can say is what is written. And what's written is that a crossbow bolt that is blessed by a cleric will instantly, simply kill a Rakshasa. While another kind of piercing weapon blessed by a cleric will go through the Rakshasa's immunities and actually hurt the creature. And then on top of that, we have what the 5th edition Monster Manual actually says, which is that you don't even technically need a blessing. The creature using the piercing weapon just has to be good, and the weapon will go through the defenses of the Rakshasa. Like always, the 5th edition Monster Manual softens everything and makes things just not as cool. But there you go. Lastly, before I go, I want to leave you with a fun twist. According to the book The Races of Faerun, there are actually tieflings with the blood of Rakshasas. See, it is a common misconception that tieflings are basically human plus devil. In reality, the actual definition of a tiefling is human plus outsider. Outsider technically being anything born outside of the material plane. Now, the common usage of the term outsider in Faerun generally reserves itself for outsiders of the evil persuasion, so that generally translates to human plus evil outsider that makes a tiefling. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that you can be a tiefling if you get a human mating with a devil, but also if you get a human mating with many other things. Like a human and a demon, for example, produces a tiefling. A human and an evil god can produce a tiefling. A human and a night hag, for example, is another possible option that creates a tiefling. But of course, the actual pertinent example, a human and the Rakshasa mating and creating a baby will produce a tiefling. Now, depending on the type of outsider that mated with a human, you of course get different traits. The common devil tiefling has the reddish skin with the horns and the tail. The night hag tiefling has bruised bluish skin, for example, and the Rakshasa tiefling gets tiger fur all over their body and feline eyes. If you ever felt like you wanted to play a tabaxi, 
but you would rather have a charisma based character rather than a dexterity based character then you can just easily play a tiefling with Rakshasa ancestry. Easy peasy. Now I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Rukato Fan, Dr. Cowbell, Skits Your Boy, Major Fail Gaming, Y Man, Barry Mascant, 5E Magic Shop, Ryan Ward, Daniel Umar, Morgan Johnson, Zach Bowell, Simon Holman, Rusty Rain, Biotechnofrag, and Meaty Ogre at best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Guys, for a second time, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all on the next video. Thank you for waiting because it was a while before my last video, but there you go. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.